I uh, can sing song after song and I've been doing it since I was about four or five years old and never get very apprehensive. But I've never stood to bring a message of what the Lord didn't I didn't have a holy fear. Knowing and realizing that what the Lord has to say and that I'll be responsible whenever I stand before him. In high school, my uh, high school teacher was the Latin teacher of the high school where I went to school and they were, uh, because so many children were not taking Latin anymore, uh, we were in, uh, she was my homeroom teacher and my counselor, and because they were not taking Latin, Latin anymore, very many were not taking Latin, she uh, proceeded to counsel all of those in her room, she was going to have to quit teaching because there wasn't demand for a Latin teacher. So everyone in our homeroom just about had to take Latin. If you were going to be a doctor, you needed four years of Latin. If you were going to be a lawyer, you needed four years of Latin. If you were going to be a garbage truck driver, you needed four years of Latin. It mattered not what you were going to be in your vocation, you needed Latin. So uh, she put the pressure on us and we all took Latin. I wondered during the first two years especially why in the world I was taking that Latin class because you can imagine what a time I had with it. Of course, I look back now and see God's providence and guidance in it because as a result of the years of Latin that I had, the first two years mostly just learning the conjugations and all those things, the second years was second two years was translating the Caesarian Wars from Latin into English and back and forth, I had a deep knowledge of the crucifixion and the Roman way of rule. And then after I was saved and began to read the Word of God and began to see in God's Word the things that took place at the cross that began to come alive to me what the Lord had truly suffered on Calvary physically for us. Folks, I'm thoroughly convinced only in glory will we ever really understand the depths of what happened on Calvary. And I know the, the spiritual application that's there. But this afternoon, with God's help, I want us to look at the physical sufferings that our Lord endured on Calvary. I... I see these pictures of what an artist supposed Jesus looked like, and there's no possible way that an individual who looks like that could have ever endured what Jesus did on Calvary. He was very much a rugged man to have had to endure what happened. And so with the Lord's help this evening, I and using my background from the, the uh, translations of what the Romans uh, used to use to bring their people into subjection, uh, I want to show you uh, what the Lord Jesus suffered physically on Calvary for us. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, we'll begin reading with the 65th verse. You know how that they had brought him before the Sanhedrin and how that they had given him uh, the little kangaroo court. They couldn't find anyone to agree on the lies that they were making up about him. And finally, the high priest turned to the Lord Jesus and said, Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the Son of God? And Jesus just said, Yes. Uh, and from now on, you'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory. And in the 65th verse begins a, the physical suffering. Matthew 26, 65 begins the physical sufferings of the Lord after the trial. In the 65th verse, it says, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, 
Who is he that smote thee? I want us to pause there and look at that 67th verse a minute. We read over this so many times till it's almost become a, a ritual at Easter time. We go over it so fast till we do not really even see all the things that God is saying to us. In that 67th verse it says, And they spit in his face. Spitting was one of the ways that in those days and even today of insulting an individual. Now, there's lots of things I could probably stand, but boy, when someone were to spit in my face, you better hope I'm full of the Lord right quick because I can't think of anything any more degrading than to spit in the face. And it wasn't a, a dry spit. They would clear their throat, and the phlegm that would come out of their throat, they would spit in the face of an individual to show their detest for them, to show how they hated them. Not only did they spit in the face of the Lord Jesus, but it says they buffeted him. That word buffet has with it a severe beating. I mean, they took their fist and they severely beat the Lord in the face, in the body. I mean, they would take their fist. The, uh, Luke and Mark says they blindfolded the Lord. You know, it's one thing whenever someone is throwing a punch at you. If you see it coming, you can roll with the punch and take away some of the blow. But if you're blindfolded and you can't see the punch coming, whenever you're... The, you, full, you receive the full blow of the lick whenever you receive the, the blow. They would beat the Lord Jesus, knocking him from one to another. His face began to bleed, his nose began to bleed, his eyes as a result of it. Severely hurting in the stomach because of the beating, the spittle hanging from his beard, and the blood beginning to ooze in amongst the beard. Uh, the Lord Jesus stood there, never opening his mouth, never said one word. Then they began to taunt him. They say, if you're really the Christ, who is it that's smiting you? Who is it that's hitting you? You know, I think about that statement. Not only, my friend, could he have told them who was doing it, he could have told them the very number of the hairs on their head. Amen. And yet, he did not retaliate in one way. Never even opened his mouth. But of course, under the, the rule of Rome, the Jews could only go so far. And the severe beating that they gave the Lord Jesus was about as far as they could go. They could not take his life because they were under the domination of the Roman rule. Beginning with the 27th verse, when the morning was come, all the, I mean the 27th chapter in the first verse, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Dropping down to the 11th verse of the 27th chapter, and Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And then you know how that they brought the accusations against the Lord, and even Pilate himself marveled that Jesus made no defense. Because as the song, song was sung a few minutes ago, Jesus knew what was going to happen. He grew the tree. He, he made the hill. He knew where he was headed. And I do not realize, I do not believe that when Jesus prayed in the garden for the cup to pass it, he was talking about the physical. I think he was talking about the spiritual. But to show you the severity of what took place and uh, the sufferings in the physical, in the 24th verse it says, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Friend, water will not wash away the guilt. It takes the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away our sins. Water will not do it. In the 25th verse it says, Then all the people said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. Had you ever thought about Barabbas' case? I got to look at that one day and got to thinking about it. Old Barabbas was in the jail, in the prison. Barabbas was a noted uh, robber in those days. In fact, he had such a severe ban that when in the hills of Judea, and you can find this in Roman history, Barabbas' name is even mentioned. He's called the son of Abbas, which Barabbas, that's what it means, the son of Abbas. 
But in regular secular history, you can find Barabbas mentioned because he had such a severe band hill, they could not travel any distance in the hills of Judea for the fear of the band of the son of Abbas. And he raped and murdered and attacked the caravans that was bringing things that people couldn't even travel for him. And the Romans saw him. In fact, the man, the, the general that finally caught Barabbas was given a special crown, a special territory because he had caught this such noted uh, robber. And Pilate gave him a choice that they could either release this one who had sown devastation in the hills of Judea or he would release Jesus unto them. And they had persuaded the people to cry for the blood of Jesus. I want us this afternoon to take a look inside that cell. Now, of course, Barabbas being in the prison, he could hear them screaming his name, knowing he was already under the sentence of death. Let's just use our sanctified imagination this evening, or this afternoon, to take a look and see about Barabbas' situation. There in that prison, probably chained between two soldiers, and in his feet in stocks, with guards on the outside because they wanted him to be watched close. He heard them shouting his name, knowing he was under the sentence of death. I can imagine maybe the conversation might have gone like this. Why are they screaming? Is it my time? Is it the day that I'm supposed to be crucified? Am I the, is it my time that they're, they're screaming for? And maybe he even heard the cohort of soldiers as they begin to come down that long corridor in that stone prison. Beginning to hear their steps and all of a sudden they came to the door where he was. And the chain began to rattle as they unlocked the door. Barabbas may be rattling the chains and shaking the chains with cursings and swearings, knowing that he was under the sentence of death, maybe even cursing the guard as he stood there, as he walked into the door. And the guard turned to him and said, Shut up, Barabbas. Keep your mouth shut. You're being set free. You deserve to die. You're the one under the sentence of death, but there's one dying in your place. His name is Jesus. Let me say, my friend, he died in my place. I was guilty. I was the one deserving of death. But that day, Barabbas was physically set free. But my friend, you and I were set free that day because we were guilty, but he died in our place. We should have been the ones. I don't know what happened to Barabbas. You never hear nothing from him in history from then on out. I kind of have the feeling that he stood in the background and watched Jesus suffer for him and watched Jesus die for him. For it says in that next sentence, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Have you ever taken a looking at the Roman have you ever taken a look at the Roman scourging and understood what they did at the scourging? We read that word and we pass over it. But today I want to describe to you what a Roman scourging really was according to the history books and according to the translations. They would take an individual and they did this in public. They did this intimidating the people. They could keep people under the rule of fear when they would see what happened to someone who was condemned by the government. They had what they call the common halls where people would really stand in the galleries and look and see what's happened. And they even forced the people to come into those places, especially those areas that were causing problems, insurrection to the Roman rule. They would bring the individual in and the people would gather around and they would take them in the center of that room where everyone could see. They would tie leather straps or, or ropes grass ropes around their arms and throw them over big beams. They would take those ropes and pull them just as tight as they could, soldiers on this side and on that side, to where the individual would be standing on their tiptoes. They would secure those ropes. Then they would take many times other straps and put around their ankles and pull them out, suspended in midair. The individual hung there ready to receive the scourging. And then they would strip them of their clothing hanging naked. Not only was the scourging the most vicious form of inhumanity beating that could ever have taken place, but the shame of it was enough. 
And the Lord Jesus Christ endured the shame of the, of the scourging also as he hung there, suspended in midair, his legs tied and his hands tied. Like a spider on a web, he was suspended in midair. The Roman scourge was a nine leather strips on a piece of, they were about three feet long on a piece of wood, a handle. In the end of those leather strips of that raw leather, they would put stones and sharp bones and pieces of metal and lead to, to weight those strips down. So when they hurled that scourge, it would go to the mark where they aimed it, and they were experts at it. They soaked that thing in brine water, a salty water, so that the raw edges of that leather would curl up and become razor sharp. And that executioner would stand in front of his victim. They stood in front of the Lord Jesus Christ with cursings and swearings and and described to him what he was getting ready to do to the blessed Lamb of God. He would take that scourge facing his victim. He would wrap that scourge around it in such a way that those leather strips would come around the individual and the weight of those lead balls would cause those sharp bones and those sharp pieces of stone to dig in deep in the back of the individual of our Lord and our Savior. And then he would give it a pull like this literally plowing furrows around the back of the precious Lamb of God. Then he would walk to the other side and do the same thing around the other side, and that leather strip would come around and dig into the back. And then he would give it a pull. The first 10 to 15 licks would tear away the outer layers of skin, literally pulling the hide off. After the first few licks, it would be deep, deep, Furs that were being plowed in the back of the Lamb of God. No wonder over in the Psalms it talks about it. It plowed deep furrows in my back. Jesus was suffering this physically for you and I. He was doing it because he loved us. He didn't have to do it, my friend. He did it because he loved us. This, the cross was not something of plan B of God. Before the foundation of the world, God looked down through the annals of time and knew that his son was going to die this death. After the first 15 licks and the pulling of the hide off, the blood began to run down the legs of our Lord and our Savior, suspended in midair and off of his toes. First of all, it would be a few drops of blood. A few drops. Then the drops would pick up as he began to plow deeper into the back of the precious Lamb of God, all the way from the shoulders to the hips. That scourge would go lick after lick. Around the, 20th, around the 16th and 17th licks, it began to tear away the fat because the, the outer layers of skin was gone and the fat went in a hurry. Then it began to plow deep into the muscles where the larger vessels were. By this time, there was a little pool of blood at the toes of our Lord and our Savior. And as they began to take that scourge and dig into that muscle, the larger vessels and the larger veins began to be penetrated begin to be sliced. Now the blood was not just dripping, but it was almost a continual stream from the toes of the Lamb of God. The very blood that would wash away the sins of the world was now being pooled on the floor of that Roman common hall. As they went deeper into the muscles, they would strike a, an artery, and with every heartbeat that the Lord's heart beat, blood would squirt into the air. Blood going everywhere. And that old Roman executioner in his defilement and in his hatred. And he got a thrill out of seeing someone suffer. He would walk around with his combat boots and he would stomp in that blood, cursing and swearing, even stomping the very blood that could wash away his sins. He began to curse and swear before the Lamb of God, calling him vulgar and vile names, stomping the blood and splattering it all over the floor. He had no respect for the very Lamb of God. He's not even to Calvary yet, folks. He's still receiving the scourge. After they got through scourging him, they gave him 39 licks. The law was 40 licks, but they were afraid that they would miss the count, so they only gave 39 licks. And the 39th lick, it tore away deep at the muscle. His back, a bloody mess from his shoulders all the way to his hips. They put his robe back on him and turned him over 
to a whole band, probably a hundred of those professional soldiers that knew how to inflict pain. In the 27th verse of the 27th chapter, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Further mockings by this vicious Roman soldier's crowd. They took the very Lamb of God, the one that was innocent, into the common hall and gathered around him in a circle. They set up a mock throne. They took the, uh, a deal of thorns, a bush of thorns, and those thorns were so poisonous that when they would prick you, even in the finger, the poison from those things would, what we call in medical terms, hemolyze the blood and it would turn purple right underneath the skin and sting like a bee sting because of the poison that was there. They took that winding of thorns and they didn't, you notice it didn't say a wreath, it said a crown. A crown meant it totally covered his head. A wreath just went around like this, and that's what you see in most of the pictures, but that's wrong. They took a crown of thorns. They made a whole crown of those thorns, piling them up on his head, and they would take those thorns and slam them down on the head of the precious Lamb of God. Those thorns going in through the skin, penetrating into the skin, hitting the skull and sliding down between the skull and the skin, pushing the skin, pulling it away from the skull the intense pain and burning of those, those poison thorns as they were slammed down on the head of the Son of God. Others of the thorns would go in, penetrate the skin, and come back out, pinning that crown of thorns to the very head of the one who died for you and I, who was paying the price. He's not even to Calvary yet, folks. He's still being humiliated in the common hall. The next time we get to complain about all of our suffering, take a look at Calvary. Take a look at Calvary and see how much he loved me and you, how much he cared for us. His face already beginning to swell from the beating that the Jewish leaders had given him. His beard already caked with blood and spittle. Now he's in the room where there's the most vicious of all human beings, demon-possessed men, that got their thrill out of seeing pain inflicted upon another human being. Not only did they put that crown of thorns on the head of the very Son of God and his head beginning to swell from the poison and from the bruising already, the Word of God says they took a stick, a reed, and began to beat him over the head. Can you imagine the pain that must have been inflicted as the very Son of God began to receive that lick over the head and yet he never even opened his mouth? his back a bloody mess, his face beaten, his eyes swollen, the spittle hanging in his beard and the blood in his beard, his back a mass of blood. Now the crown of thorns on the head beginning to swell and the pain burning. There's no way to describe it. This band began to gather around him again to do things to the Lord Jesus Christ. I could not even relate to you what they did to some in public. Some of the things they did in the very face of the Son of God. Look with me, if you will, over to Psalms 22. Psalms 22 and verse 12 gives another description of what took place in that room. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. One of the customs of that day, Psalms 22 and verse 12, one of the customs of that day, and they did this to Stephen also, was that when those soldiers would get so worked up and begin to see the pain inflicted upon an individual, they would go wild and then they would jump on the individual and pounce upon them, biting them, literally biting hunks of flesh out and spitting it in their face. The Word of God says in that 13th verse, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Friend, do you realize what Jesus suffered for me and you? Can you imagine 
the pain that was being inflicted upon the very Son of God. He says, I'm poured out like water in the 14th verse. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Have you ever had pain so severe that your mouth became so dry that you could not even speak? In 1970, the Lord used an automobile wreck to get my attention, to turn my life around. I was pinned in that wreckage for two and a half hours. My legs were crushed and banged up against the motor. And water from the radiator and the oil from the motor leaked on my left leg and burned it all the way to the bone. There was no way I could move my leg, and the pain was so severe before the doctors finally got out there in the ditch and began to administer to me. The pain was so severe that when I would try to talk to the firemen and the policemen, my tongue would stick to the top of my mouth. And I'd have to take my finger and pull my tongue down that I would be able to try to tell them what was going on. That's exactly the description that he says here. He says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, and my friend, that's exactly what they were. They were dogs that day that had surrounded our blessed Lord. The very Lamb of God was surrounded by a bunch of hellish dogs that day, or the day that he paid the price for me and you. He says, dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Over in Isaiah, the 50th chapter, and the 6th verse, gives another little description, a little insight of some of the things that happened to our Lord that day. Isaiah 50 and verse 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my, sa my face from shame and spitting. That's what I was talking to you about a minute ago. I could not tell you in public what that shame was, what they did to the very Son of God. I'm talking about the one that stepped out on the edge of nothing and spoke it all into existence. The very one that could have spoken just one word or the wave of a hand and 72,000 angels would have come and wiped that whole bunch out. But he didn't do it, and the reason he didn't call is because of his love for me and you. He was innocent. He was innocent. He says, I gave my back to the smiters in that sixth verse. My cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Jesus had a full beard. I see some of you have got beards. How would you like, after your face had been beaten by the fist and the spittle and the blood caked upon it, someone to run their hand up in the middle of that beard and give a hard jerk, many times pulling the hide right off the jawbone? The very face of the Lord Jesus Christ was so mutilated. They would run their hand in that beard after it was already bruised and swollen from the beating and take handfuls of hair, many times almost pulling the hide right off the bone. Isaiah 52 and verse 14 says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. Listen to me, my friend. The face of the Lord Jesus Christ did not even look like a human being. That verse says he didn't even look like a man. He was so mutilated, his eyes so swollen, the, the beard hanging in shreds, his back a bloody mess, his head swollen from the crown of thorns, of the poison from those things. I'm talking about the Son of God, folks. I'm talking about the very lamb that died to take away the sins of the world. The suffering, the physical suffering that he went through for me and you. Oh, I love him this afternoon. I love him not just because of the physical sufferings that he went through, but because he did it because of love for me. I never knew what love was apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not even to Calvary yet. He's not even to the cross. In the, 30th ver in the 31st verse of Matthew, the 27th chapter, it says, And after that, they had mocked him. 
they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. There on Galgotha's hill called Calvary, after Simon had carried the cross of Jesus, the Lamb of God stood beside the cross that he was going to be crucified on. The soldiers again stripped the clothing off of him. He stood naked. Part of the shame of the dying on the tree was the nakedness. He stood there beside it. They viciously grabbed him and slung him down on the cross. Three or four of the Roman soldiers got on one arm and extended it out. They took a, a crude iron nail and a mallet and with sharp blows they worked that nail right between the bones. Right in this area right here was the customary place where they pinned their arm to the cross. Because you see there's strong tendons and sinews around that area that will not pull out and they go right between those bones and right in between those bones is the radial nerve one of the leading nerves in the arm. And when that nerve is traumatized, it causes... Traumatized. Many times, muscle contractions similar to Charlie horses is what we call them today. We'd go through that arm as the fingers begin to cringe, uncontrollably cramps begin to go through that arm as if the flesh began to quiver and the muscles begin to quiver from the intense pain that he went through. And they would walk over to the other side and get a hold of his arm and pull it tight, stretching him outstretched tight on that cross and do the same thing on the other arm, driving the nail, sharp blows, pinning it. And the muscles going into spasms begin to profusely meet the Son of God against that old rugged cross. Oh, it wasn't a shiny cross like that. It was hewn cruelly with a hatchet-type instrument, splinters sticking out on it all over it. And as they begin to profusely beat, the muscles begin to contract and relax and begin to beat him on that cross. Those splinters begin to dig into his back that was already mutilated. Again, opening the wounds, and the blood began to ooze from those wounds. They would go down to the feet. They'd get the feet and pull them hard against the arms, putting one foot on top of the other. They would work that nail down between those bones and pin his feet to that cross. He didn't have a foot stand. The only thing that held his feet down was a nail that went through the two feet like so. And then they would tie ropes on the end of that thing and one soldier would guide the foot of that cross into a pre-dug hole. As the cross began to lift up, as it began to lift up, the weight of the Lord Jesus began to shift to those nails in his hand. And after it reached a certain height, it would drop with a thud down into the bottom of that hole. And all the weight of the very Son of God began to pull on those nails. The nerves again in those arms being traumatized and began to profusely beat the Son of God against that cross. Friend, can you imagine the physical suffering that the blessed Lamb of God suffered for me and you? Oh, I cannot in my... In, in my wildest imagination, imagine the intense pain that he suffered, and yet he never even opened his mouth, never said one word, never uttered one groan recorded in the Word of God, and I believe it would have been recorded if he had them. And as the weight began to pull on those arms, he could take air in, but he could not expel air out. For in order for your lungs to push the air out, the diaphragm has to be lifted. And when he was sagging like this, there was no way he could breathe in, but he couldn't breathe out. 
and you talk about pain, when your lungs begin to fill with carbon dioxide which comes back to the lungs to be expelled, the pain is so severe you feel like they're going to burst. And the only relief, if you can call it relief, that the Son of God could get was to push up on that nail, put all of his weight on that nail that was in his feet and force himself up enough to relieve a little bit from the arm so that he would be able to push the air out. That's the reason all the statements on the cross were short because when the Lord made those statements, it was when he was putting all of his weight on that nail. And when the pain would be so great in the, on that nail, again he would sag down, putting all the weight on the arms, and up and down and up and down, again opening the wounds, and the precious blood of the Lamb of God began to soak up that old rugged cross and begin to run down that old rugged cross into that hole at the foot of the cross. The very blood that would wash away our sins, the very blood, as Brother Paul said this morning, that would forgive us our sins, the only thing is, the only thing that would wash away our sins would begin to run down that old rugged cross. And Jesus never opened his mouth in pain or agony. All of nature mourned the dying of the Lamb of God. And the scripture tells us that it's all held together by him. But when the Son of God died that day, all of nature mourned his death. Hanging on that cross. Listen, friend, if it had have taken it to satisfy God, Jesus could have hung there six months. But when it was totally finished, when God was satisfied, there wasn't any need of him hanging there any longer. I like the way the scripture is pointed out. In the 46th verse, it says, of the 27th chapter, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only time in the word of God that Jesus ever called his father God. The only recordings. You know why he, had, he called him God? Because he became sin for me and you. He could not have the relationship of his father. Listen, my friend, all the pain that Jesus suffered that day on Calvary, all the pain that he suffered before he ever got to Calvary, he never opened his mouth. But when his father had to break fellowship with him, when his father had to turn his back on his son because he could not look upon sin, he couldn't stand it any longer, and he cried out in anguish, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I like the way it said he cried with a loud voice. You know, ordinarily when an individual is dying, their last words as their life is ebbing out is very soft. And you have to get real close to even hear what they're saying. I believe the Holy Ghost of God is letting us know Jesus gave his life up. Nobody took it. He gave it. Look what it says in the 50th verse. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He gave it up, friend. I want you to know nobody took his life. As I said earlier, he could have hung there six months if that's what it would have taken to appease the wrath of God for mine and your sins. But when it was over, when the, the debt was paid, when it was finished, when the debt was paid, he yielded up the ghost. And they took that mutilated body and wrapped it in grave clothes and put it in a borrowed tomb. The only one I know that ever borrowed a tomb and gave it back practically unused. For you see, friend, the dying on the cross was not the end, but the beginning. For on the third day, on the third day, when they come to embalm him is what they were coming to do, to perform the embalming ceremony on the Lamb of God. You can't embalm a live body. And when they got there, he is gone. The angel, the scripture says there was an earthquake. You know, they stationed soldiers around the tomb to prevent anybody from 
going into the tomb. But the angel, the Word of God says there was an earthquake and the angel came and rolled the stone away. He wasn't no sneak. He sat down on the stone to see what they was going to do, I believe. And they come there to see. And he told them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He did what he said he would do. He arose. And my friend, this afternoon he's alive. And he sits at the right of the Father, making intercession for you and I. The ones to whom that he suffered and bled and died on Calvary, he sits making intercession for me and you this evening. Yes, I love him. How I love him. Not only for what he suffered physically for me, but all the other realm of Calvary. That includes the spiritual as well as everything else, the realms of Calvary. I don't understand it all. But my friend, I'm telling you, I'm enjoying my salvation. I'm grateful he suffered for me that day. And when I get to thinking that I'm having it rough, and when I get to thinking that, I, that danger, that I'm having it real bad, I just take another look at Mount Calvary and see what Jesus suffered for me. And my friend, it gives me the strength to go on. It gives me the strength to go on. I've never had anybody spit in my face. I've never received discouraging from a Roman. I've never been hung on a cross. Jesus did it all for me. Do you know how much he loves you? You understand this evening how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. We've just seen the physical suffering that he did for me and you. We love him because he first loved us. He demonstrated and manifested his love toward me and you by suffering what he did on Calvary. We ought to love him in return. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the Lamb that suffered bled and died that we might live. Thank you, Lord. You just didn't say you loved us. You showed us how much you loved us. Lord, may in the weeks and days to come when we get on our pity parties, we'll remember what Jesus suffered for us. And may our light shine for the glory and the honor of the blessed Lamb of God who is worthy of our praise, adoration, and loyalty. For it's in his lovely name we pray. Amen.